I love spending time with you, Sferina. I think we should see how the 3D shapes Kubert. What? After all we've been through? We've been floating in nothingness for weeks. I'm sure we both deserve better. But I like this empty void. It is nice and simple. I'm sorry, Kubert. But you're too much of a square for me. I want to see what is up there, behind the corners. I guess it's the end then, huh? Yeah. See you around. Poor Kubert. Will he ever recover? I guess it is not hip to be square. I'm sorry. I am Mr. Philgood, awkward being and digital illustrator. I draw this stuff. What do you think? Wow, really? Thanks, Mum. In today's tutorials about learning digital art, we will create a simple background to place your characters in. If this is the first video you're watching, make sure to check out my prior lesson in which I teach you how to block a sphere or a cube. Before we start slapping color on canvas, you need to understand the concept of perspective real fast. Perspective is the technique that allows you to portray the real 3D world on a 2D surface, like on canvas or paper. You could just drop your 3D item on a flat background, but for better immersing yourself and the viewer in your illustration, you need to grasp this paramount concept. Like all things in art, you don't need to follow the rules at all times, but it's good to understand them beforehand. Did you know? Perspective was introduced in art during the Renaissance in Italy in 1415 by the architect Filippo Brunelleschi. What a lad! They should have named a ninja turtle after him. To start with, let us cast a line. This is your horizon, in an infinitely far away line that is usually opposite to the viewer's point of view. You can see the horizon yourself in real life. Look outside of a window, and as you gaze far away, you will notice the land and the sky blending with one another. That is the horizon. The most used type of perspective is the one-point perspective. This is the easiest and most efficient to get your head around. Here you have only one vanishing point on your horizon line, and if one axis is parallel with the picture plane, then all elements are either parallel to the picture plane, horizontally or vertically, or perpendicular to it. All elements that are parallel to the picture plane are drawn as parallel lines. All elements that are perpendicular to the picture plane converge at a single vanishing point on the horizon. What, you got none of that? Yeah, me neither. <laughs> uh. This is easier shown and said. Have a look. This is my horizon, and this is my vanishing point. You can place the line wherever you want, but the point has to be on it. Done? Now let us draw the base of a square, closer to us. And as you notice, set line is parallel to the horizon. Parallel means they never touch, like two frat boys that say no homo every two seconds. Now cast two lines from your vanishing point to the two ends of your square. It will kind of look like an ice cream cone at this point. Now from both point, draw two straight lines that are perpendicular to the horizon lines. Perpendicular means that the two lines make four 90 degrees angles and touch only once. Like two frat boys that tried something kinky and probably is never to talk about it ever again. We're almost there. Now connect the remaining edges and you got a one point perspective cube. Inside this cube, you can build what you want. A tree, a sphere, or a frat boy desperately crying over the phone. I hope he's well. Of course, you also have two point and three point perspectives, which have two or three vanishing points on the horizon. These are more advanced techniques, which I would suggest you look up once you truly grasp how one point perspective works. You got four and five point perspective too, but I'm not even going to attempt those since they give me a headache just from looking at them. Okay, now with the perspective out of the way, we can finally start blocking our majestic background. As usual, I'm only going to use grayscale for this exercise, because I want you to understand how light works first of all. Also do not go too crazy with the design itself, unless you are making an epic illustration of it or the scenery itself is the main focus. It is the background's duty to encase the scene, but not stand out too much. Ah, would you look at that, good old white canvas, you remember our three friends, the tones? shadow, meat tone and highlight, we are still only going to use these three cuties, perhaps not as extremely though. 
we will be using the classical technique used by Leonardo da Vinci, called aerial perspective. To summarize in a few words, scenery that is far away and close to your horizon line will be much lighter, almost blending with the sky itself, while anything close will be much more detailed and darker. I usually do all the background stuff in one layer, because I'm a deranged man, but please, feel free to make a different layer for each tone, to make it easier later to tweak and add details. Let us start with the furthest tone, a light grey, similar to the big white. This part of the background is the least detailed, but helps a lot setting up the scale for the whole piece. We will draw some simple mountains, so make their silhouette, nice and simple triangles. Notice how the tips of the mountains are not too crazy, I did this because I want to show that they are pretty far away. Now let us grab the mid-tone and paint over some of the lighter tone, this time I am going to create some smaller hills. These are closer than the mountains, so you can add small details here and there such as trees, houses or some town, whatever you fancy, but try to work mostly with your silhouettes. Size is important too, mind you. From the silhouette, you can tell it is a tree, but if it is a tiny like a broccoli, your viewer will assume that this is a faraway tree. Well done. Now with the latest tone, the darkest one. Now remember that it does not need to stand out as much as the darkest area of your 3D item. A dark grey will suffice. I usually leave the darkest colour or the black for the shadow casted by my 3D item or for some dramatic effect. Now, the closest element of the background is the most detailed and influential. Here you can really go ham with whatever you want. Whether you paint a tree or a house, your viewer here will get a real idea of its point of view. Is your 3D item really small? Paint here something really small like a snail shell or a tall flower. Or perhaps your main focus is a giant creature. Then slap here some trees and houses, but make them smaller to make your beast a real absolute unit. And there you go. Your three main elements, one after the other. Do not be afraid to try things out, but remember this simple technique to keep your picture easy to read. It is not an issue at all if the planes overlap but the darkest tone should be above them all, and the lightest in the back. Otherwise it will look a bit, um, puzzling? I don't want to say crap. Can you say crap on YouTube? Yeah? What about oh, Okay, fair enough. Another clever technique I was taught by my old masters is the addition of a foreground. I hope you saved the darkest tone, champ, because you are going to need it now. Using black for the foreground is not a bad idea at all. It is perfect to create this sense of tight space surrounding the viewer and is a fantastic storytelling device. Go your background? Good. Make a new layer above it all and put some detailed elements around the sides of your illustration. You can use fancy brushes if you want to speed up this part, otherwise use whatever you want. I like the classic leaves and plants. This conveys the idea that the viewer is hiding or peeking through some bushes. Plus add some flowers for some cuteness or brambles for danger. What about a spider web? Or even some bones? As always, try things out, but do not overdo it. The foreground is there to frame the picture further, not to take any attention away from the main subject. Now that you got a simple background set up, you can leave it as it is for a stylistic look, or blend the different planes with one another for more realism. So add a touch of darker grey to your furthest plane, or some more subtle highlights to your mid plane. As you grow bad at this, I want to reveal your secret. I often do not do backgrounds. You what, mate? I know, I know. The thing is, I like character design above all, so I don't want to always spend time coming up with the background when I just want to draw a spooky creature. So what do I do? The same thing, but dumb down. Let me show you. My creature pokes from the darkness, not light, so my planes are inverted. The darkness is the furthest plane, and the light source is the closest. I slapped the darkest tone as background, and later with a texture brush, I applied the mid-tone over it, almost as if it is a fog, poking through the darkness. The lightest color in the foreground has a double use. It helps my character to stand out the most as I build the silhouette, and brings out even more of the overwhelming gloom of the surrounding darkness. Yikes! You surprised I do not follow my own tutorial? Well here it is, sport. Learn art and pull it apart. All great artists start with similar notions, but later apply them in completely different ways. 
art academies like to teach a build in different rooms, but they ultimately do not really matter. Art is an interpretation of reality and of your thoughts. How you bring these to life with music, painting or erotic cakes, it is down to you. Take what you like, learn what you need, and give birth to something beautiful. Phew! What a day! Hope you had fun, unlike Hubert. Try this simple exercise and you'll be churning masterpieces in no time. Stay tuned for my next tutorial, in which we will make the most of placing any 3D item in your freshly baked background. Until next time, stay safe and look after yourself. Here is Mr. Feelgood, bless your face.